Now I'm going to introduce you to this compound, LDA, which is short for lithium diisopropyl amide. I think that's a hilarious name because it's not actually an amide, it's an amine. LDA is a useful base for removing alpha hydrogens to form enolates. How does it do this? Well, as we've discussed in the past, anytime you see an atom like this, lithium, or one of its brethren that's in the first column of the periodic table, potassium or sodium, we see one of these atoms, lithium, potassium, or sodium, bound to an atom that's found toward the right end of the periodic table. We know that this is an ionic bond, so we can effectively treat this compound as if there were a negative charge on the nitrogen. So if I have the negative charge on the nitrogen, and it's staring at a carbonyl compound like this one, what's going to happen? Well, of course, that negatively charged nitrogen is going to strip one of those alpha hydrogens, dumping the electrons into the alpha carbon to give me this enolate. This then converts this negatively charged nitrogen species into this product, diisopropyl amine. This is how LDA removes alpha hydrogens. Let's compare the basicity of LDA with that of hydroxide. If I have a carbonyl compound like cyclohexanone shown here, and I react that with hydroxide, you will note that there might be some minor removal of one of these alpha hydrogens by the hydroxide ion. So let's pretend this hydroxide removes an alpha hydrogen, gives me this enolate, which is of course in, exists in these two resonant structures. You'll note that when that hydroxide removes the hydrogen from this alpha position, it then becomes water, which is the conjugate acid of the hydroxide. Now I want to tell you guys that this reaction almost doesn't proceed hardly at all. In other words, this enolate is only going to exist in less than 0.1% concentration. Why? Well, the reason has to do with pKa. You'll look at water here and see that the pKa of the protons in water is 15.7. The pKa of an alpha proton in cyclohexanone is 17. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the protons in water are actually more acidic than the alpha proton on cyclohexanone. So what that means is that even if I were able to transiently form a small amount of this enolate, it would actually tear a proton off of water and revert back to the starting materials much more prevalently than the starting materials would be deprotonated to form this enolate. Once again, all because this product, water, is much more acidic than the alpha proton over here in the starting material. Let's compare that with LDA. Once again, the pKa of the alpha proton here in cyclohexanone is 17. When LDA strips that alpha proton, it is converted into diisopropyl amine. The pKa of the diisopropyl amine is 35. That means that diisopropylamine is much, much, much less acidic than the alpha proton over here in cyclohexanone. Hence, this enolate is not going to be able to rip off a proton from diisopropylamine and re revert back to the starting material. Thus, if I incubate cyclohexanone with LDA, it will convert to this enolate in almost 100% conversion. Now, enolates can react in one of two different ways. One way under basic conditions, and another under acidic conditions. Under basic conditions, the base strips the alpha hydrogen here to generate this enolate, which is, of course, existing in these two resonant structures. If I introduce an electrophile into the system, what can occur is the negative charge that's existing here at this carbon can reach out and grab that electrophile, forming a bond between the carbon and the electrophile. This type of product is called an alpha-substituted product. The same type of product can also be generated under acidic conditions. However, the mechanism traversed is a little bit different from the, that in basic conditions. Under acidic conditions, what occurs is the lone pair electrons up here on this carbonyl oxygen reach up and grab a proton from the acid source. This gives me this intermediate. Then the water byproduct can now strip an alpha hydrogen, 
thrusting the electrons in here to form a double bond and pushing these electrons up into the oxygen to neutralize its positive charge. This gives me an enol. This is not an enolate, it's an enol. At this stage, if I introduce an electrophile into the system, the lone pairs on this oxygen in the enol can come down and push these pi electrons into the electrophile, effectively forming a bond between the alpha carbon and the electrophile. The oxygen is now positively charged because it thrust its electrons down to form this double bond. So the water will come, remove that hydrogen to neutralize the positive charge, and give me the same product that was formed under the basic conditions, while also regenerating hydronium, which can act as an acid source in the next cycle of this reaction. I want you to once again pay attention to the nuances. Basic conditions and acidic conditions can effectively form the exact same product. However, the mechanisms are slightly different between the two. The first reaction we'll learn here, then, is the alpha halogenation of ketones, which has to be done under acidic conditions, not basic conditions, for reasons that I'll explain momentarily. Thus, if I treat a ketone, as shown here in these two examples, with catalytic acid and halogen, such as chlorine, bromine, or iodine, then what will occur is a single one of these protons of the alpha carbon will be removed and replaced with a single one of the halogen atoms thrown into the system. Here's the mechanism of that formation. Once again, the carbonyl uh, oxygen will thrust its lone pairs into the acid to become protonated. The water then removes the alpha hydrogen to generate this enol. The lone pairs on this oxygen come down thrust these pi electrons out to grab our halogen atom and place it on the alpha carbon. And then water comes and neutralizes this charge by deprotonating it. This gives me my, me my singly alpha halogenated product. There's another way of doing the same reaction, and that is to just treat this type of starting material with PBr3 followed by water. This reaction, or way of doing this reaction, is called the hell volhard zelinsky reaction, which is featured in section 19.6 of your textbook. You should note that we've talked thus far in organic chemistry about a Heck reaction and now a Hell reaction. I think this might be as profane as organic chemistry will get this semester. <laughs> now you heard me mention earlier that you cannot do alpha halogenation under base promoted conditions. I'm going to show you why. Under basic conditions, all of the alpha hydrogens end up getting replaced with halogen atom. So what occurs is the base removes a single alpha hydrogen, giving me a negative charge at the alpha carbon. That negative charge reaches out, grabs a halogen to put a, a single halogen on that alpha carbon. But the problem is that at that stage, you can't stop the base from removing the second alpha hydrogen. Thus, there's a new negative charge that also gets halogenated, halogenated. Consequently, you can't run a single monohalogenation at the alpha position under basic conditions. If you want to add a single halogen atom at the alpha position, you have to do it under acidic conditions. Because if you do it under basic conditions, you will completely replace all of the hydrogens on the alpha carbon with halogen atoms. Here is the mechanism of that reaction. I won't address it with excruciating detail, but will instead allow you to look at it for yourselves.